Wolf. Welcome all to the Snail Trail 4x4 Podcast. If you like going off-roading in Toyotas, wrenching on Toyotas, camping in Toyotas, and maybe even poking a little bit of fun at Toyotas, and of course, hearing about how fantastic tacos are lifted and geared, then this is the podcast for you. That's right, ladies and germs. I'm Tyler, and I'm really excited for this episode because uh, it's a topic that both Jimmy and I have wet dreams over that may be TMI, but we don't care. (laughs) We've talked a lot about it in the past, and we're excited as hell for this. So, Jimmy, how the hell are you, man? I'm good, Tyler. I'm good. Thanks for asking. How are you doing? Oh, man. Today's been a long day, but it's been fantastic. It has. It's been a great day. We've had a few good interviews today. Mm Mm-hmm leading up to uh, the extraction of Bali. So we were, we're kind of <laughs> yeah. getting ahead of schedule here a little bit. Uh-huh. But uh, yeah, we have an excellent interview for you guys today. So something that, like Tyler said, that both him and I are excited about and excited that these things are coming onto the market and uh, with from an excellent company. Mm-hmm. And we are going to be talking to Quinn from 74 Weld in just a little bit. But before we do, we do have some announcements to make some housekeeping to go over. Mm -hmm. I guess the really big one is that our weekly giveaway from flex power tools, the one where you're tagging a friend is over done, 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 done closed. We will be announcing the winners for that giveaway on Thursday's episode. So Mm -hmm. keep your ear holes open and make, like we've said all month, make sure to be keeping up to date on the podcast and hopefully you won. Hey, what a coincidence. The my post tagging you one. I know somebody tagged <laughs> snail figure. armor, and I was like, "Thanks, I could use these tools." <laughs> right. I don't know if I'm allowed to win, but <laughs> <laughs> well, it's technically well, no, it is you. You haven't made an LLC yet, so yeah. If it was a uh, like if Morphlate won, that wouldn't be me. So oh, okay. Morphlate could win one. I'll have an LLC before Thursday. Perfect. <laughs> Look at that all set up. <laughs> and it'll be weird. You know, snail yeah. armor is going to win. Oh, yeah. <laughs> snail armor, more flight. Hey. hey. <laughs> yeah. More flight tag snail armor. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. Too many shenanigans going on here today. So we'll announce those winners on Thursday. So pay attention. We do have the uh, snail squad is the remaining giveaway for the month for flex power tool month. And that is a really bitching kit with, I think we counted eight tools, eight tools in there. Yep. Mm -hmm. So some really cool stuff coming. We'll talk a little bit more about that on Thursday as well. Uh, We have a long episode today because we had a little too much fun nerding out talking about gears. Pretty much, yeah. Uh, Let's see. Was there anything else? Reviews giveaway? We got that always going on, so make sure you guys are leaving reviews. Uh, We're almost to 550, 550 reviews, so we're doing a swag pack there. And then once we reach 750, they're giving away a set of tires from Yokohama Tires. So be on the lookout for that to come around, and everybody go leave as many reviews as you can. And don't forget which ones you leave. Put them in a note somewhere on your phone. I think that about does it. I think that's good. I short mean, and sweet th- yeah, today. This episode went long, so let's keep this one, <laughs> this intro short. Cool. All right, man. So uh, we'll go a short break here. We'll listen uh, to hear a little, hey, what's going on from Brian over at Four Wheel Underground. And then we'll be right on back with a really cool episode from 74 Weld talking all about portals. Mmm. Portal tacos. Portal tacos. <laughs> All right. Grab your favorite drinks, everybody. Grab your favorite tacos. And we'll be right on back with Quinn. Are you tired of landing in potholes and bouncing off obstacles? To play at your full potential, correctly tuned coilovers allow you to float over the rocks and gain more traction. At Four Wheel Underground, our full suspension systems include custom tuned coilovers for your specific application. To learn more, visit fourwheelunderground.com. Oh, welcome back, ladies, gentle ladies, everybody else out there. We are here today with a really fun episode, one that we've been kind of, I don't know about joking about for a while, but we've kind of been joking that we were going to get this gentleman on. And then all of a sudden, 
the stars aligned and we're like, oh my God, we actually can get him on, (laughs) on the podcast here for an interview. You're doing some super awesome things that we're going to be chatting about that I think everybody wants to know about. So I guess without further ado, we have Quinn here from 74 Weld, the portal master himself. Quinn, (laughs) go ahead and say hi to everybody so everyone knows what you sound like. Yeah. Uh, thanks for having me, man. I definitely, I I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, dude, for sure. You've kind of, I don't want to say exploded out of nowhere, but, um, you've definitely been coming around and with the advances that you've been making in portals and 74 weld has, you've kind of made a pretty big name for yourself, at least here in the States, um, in terms of the industry of portals, which, there has there I don't I don't I almost want to say you're kind of building <laughs> the industry. Really, yeah. yeah. You're you're kind of well, building the industry. Yeah, I mean, I've been on the back end of the off-road industry for 20 years. Um I make parts for a lot of people within the off-road industry. I've just kind of shifted that focus to my own stuff really because it's just a it's it started as a hobby and then it turned into, uh, I think I can do this for racing. And now it's, I think I can actually do this for mass market. So that's cool. we're new to a lot of people. We're not new to kind of more of the core, like hardcore crowd. Yeah. Um, the people who are deeply off-road. ingrained in the off-road industry. Yeah. <laughs> Which is a super small percentage. I think that the off-road industry is one of the, the biggest small market community because <laughs> everyone kind of <laughs> yeah. just knows each other. Um, it's a, it's a big yeah. community. Everyone yeah, knows about everybody. So I'm definitely new to the Toyota stuff because mm-hmm. like I, I was a Jeep guy for a long time and then I was a buggy guy and now I'm trying to branching out and uh, going down to the dark side. It's okay. We'll accept you on the dark side over here. It's, it's funner yeah. over here anyway. So as long as you're making portals. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, right. So cool, man. So you've been in the off-road industry for 20 so years. How did that all start for you? Did you have an off-roading family, a big outdoor recreation family? How did you, <laughs> how'd you get into this? Uh, no, uh, when I was in, I was in college. Um, I went to UCSD. I was actually like studying to go to, or I was supposed to be studying for law school. And oh, wow. instead of doing that, I was like missing exams and <laughs> basically working on my Jeep going off roading. Yep. Um, I'm the only, I didn't do it growing up. I just kind of got into it in college, which was I don't know, a little over 20 years ago. And uh, just, been into it ever since. Like the first trip that I made to Johnson Valley was like 2003. Oh, wow. And so I've been kind of involved and hooked ever since. When did a uh, sledgehammer get initiated? Yeah. Oh, that was in the nineties. That was that before, was okay. that was before my time there. Yeah. So gotcha. Victor Valley four wheelers cut that trail. I want to say, I think the date is on the plaque and I, for some reason, I want to say 1997. Now I totally could be wrong about that, Mm -hmm. but most of the like main hammer trails were cut in the uh, late nineties. And there's actually, I have some good stories about some of the trails, which I don't know if we'll go there or not, but like spooners, Uh I'll touch super briefly. So spooners was, there were two guys from Temecula who were in Jeeps and broke out there. They thought they were in outer limits. The reason Spooners is called Spooners is it was a cold night and they had no choice. <laughs> that, that's so they were stuck yeah. out there. That's <laughs> yeah. why it's called Spooners. But yeah. Uh-huh. Now everybody takes their yeah. race sleeping bags with them. So they don't have to become a, <laughs> <laughs> right. a victim of Spooners. Yeah. Uh, that's fun. Yeah. Um, so cool, man. Yeah, we've, uh, we're probably going to get uh, somebody from... Uh, either Victor Valley or somebody who's down in Johnson Valley all the time about uh, a sledgehammer when it was initiated, but that's cool, dude. So you've been around for a while. You obviously had your priorities straight in um, skipping the law school exams to work on your Jeep. So (laughs) (laughs) I I mean, I don't know, you know, you where it takes you. And as long as you're alert, you end up where you want to be. And as long as you like what you're doing, who cares? Sorry, are you yeah. glad about this path you've taken rather than going down the law degree area? Depends on what day you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. Yeah. That's cool, man. So what was your first Jeep? Uh, 1991 YJ. Oh, square headlights. Okay. Yeah. Barbie, Barbie yep. crowd. First year of fuel injected. Okay. 
Nice. What did you yeah. end up doing to that Jeep or at what point did you end up getting rid of it? I did everything down to links, coilovers, cut half the frame off, cut half the tub off, basically built a buggy and then realized I should have just built a buggy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then the running gear actually. So I tore all the running gear out of that and Jim real, you know, J E real. Yep. Mm -hmm. So Jim bought the running gear out of that. And then a guy named Kelly Marquis bought the chassis and I started over and I built the buggy after that. Nice. Yeah. All right. So you did have yeah. some sort of fabrication skills or did you, were you just learning no, no. On your, as you go? I mean, I'm a big proponent of looking at something and going, well, if he does it, how hard can it be? And so literally I learned how to fab by, there was a forum back in the day called Jeepaholics. And I haven't heard I of that one. Be on the, I don't think it's around anymore. But I was on that forum and one of the guys who I'm still good friends with to this day was like, oh, I could teach you how to weld. Okay. And, nice. and so it all kind of started where I took the Jeep out. I broke, and of all things, I broke the rear track bar mount, which is those things had a track bar on a leaf spring suspension, right? Like you don't yeah, need that anyways. Yeah, it right. Throw away. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. No, I paid, I paid somebody to have that fixed. And it was like 500 bucks. And then the next weekend I took it out and I broke it again. And I'm like, mm. uh oh. And so I did a little research. A welder was 600 bucks and to fix it again was 500 bucks. And I'm like, so I borrowed 600 bucks and I bought a welder and that was the start of it. Yeah. And the rest is history. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's pretty cool. So, how did you get into machining then? Were you just kind of like getting to the point where you're like, tolerances aren't good enough with a cutoff wheel on a grinder. So we need <laughs> um, to me, like it was kind of a, a natural progression, I guess. So mm -hmm. I was in fabrication. I was starting to get into like aerospace welding. And one of my friends, um, I guess kind of growing up, he's about a decade older than me. He owned, when I met him, he owned a company called gravity skateboards and I was a big skater and surfer growing up. And then as you do in San Diego, ended, right. <laughs> and then he ended up, um, starting a machine shop and he's got like a, it's a big machine shop and he had, you know, he saw the stuff I was doing and like off road and he was into that too. And he had a, a, a mill that he's like, Hey, I'm going to sell this for 10 grand. Do you want it? And I went, hell yeah. And so I bought that and just kind of transitioned down that road. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Um, it's funny mentioning, you know, getting a, a used mill like that. There's a, somebody else we've talked to. Was it Derek? It was Derek. He kind of, he ended up getting a mill, uh, a Bridgeport, I think it was. I don't recall. But anyways, he got one. He goes, the friggin' the first NASA space station, the trip to the moon was built on one of these. Why can't I, once you have one of these, there's, it opens up so many doors as to what you can do and what you can yeah. create. And I should preface that I had a mill in LA before that, but I bought, um, it's called a proto track. It's a conversational, very basic three axis that you kind of program on the controller. Okay. And so it's limited, but they're still like super versatile. And I still have a couple proto tracks to this day. <laughs> nice. So yeah. cool. Um, how'd you go from off-roading? Cause you're not, you don't, you, you don't look that old. How old, how old are you? If you don't mind asking. 41. You're 41. Yeah. So yeah. you would have been doing, getting into the YJ and your what, early 20s? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I think about 20. Yeah. About 20. So just over two decades, you've gone from yeah. not knowing how to weld, borrowing 600 bucks to buy a <laughs> welder, to fix your track bar on a leaf sprung Jeep, uh, yeah. to, to having, uh, to doing aerospace machining essentially and welding and all yep. the parts development design. That's pretty rad, man. Yeah. I mean, we still do a fair amount of aerospace stuff. Like I've got, we do parts for Boeing, for GE aviation, for Honda aerospace, you know, a bunch of companies. Um, so say, we still do a lot of job shop work. Is that Honda aerospace? Yeah. Honda has a whole aerospace program. It's, I never uh, knew that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, oh, yeah. Why yeah. don't you give us a yeah. rundown of what seven four weld is, or is it seven four weld or seventy four weld? Do you have a preference on so, how you say it? It doesn't really matter. So <laughs> I, I guess I should I should preface this because I get this question all of it. And since we talk about age, I was not born in nineteen seventy four. 
the 74 came from the periodic table of elements. And I was trying to come up with a name and I was sitting there chatting with my brother and my brother goes, well, you're welding the, the 74th element on the periodic table is Wolfram, which is tungsten, which is like the main component of the type of welding I was doing at the time. Okay. okay. So it just kind of, all right, we'll call it 74 weld. And when I got into machining, I was like, oh, I should change the name. And I'm like, and it just was one of those things where it fell by the wayside. And then I thought about it again when I was going to like launch the portal stuff for mass market. And I just went, if something doesn't interest me, I don't spend any time on it. Mm-hmm. And the name of a company to me is kind of like, I don't know, what does IBM stand for? Who cares? <laughs> it's just IBM. Whatever. Move right. on. So, yeah. That's cool. I, I did not know that it actually had a, a, a meaning behind it besides just some numbers because... Yeah, I, I, yeah. I did the math myself, figured out you weren't born in 74, <laughs> nope. especially Me since too. I was yeah. born in 1980. So <laughs> I could figure yeah. that one out. So why don't you tell us about 74 Weld and what what it's doing these days and kind of how it became, you know, how it started? Yeah. So I still do a ton of fabrication work, but like 90% of that is government, military, or port security. So no photos, you know, mm-hmm. don't really talk about any of that stuff much. Yeah. High security stuff. Uh, I mean, anybody that says, you know, my general manager has top secret clearance for stuff. But the reality is when we make parts, we're making like a small portion of something much larger. And whether it's top secret or not, we don't have any clue and we don't really care what it is. Like I joke that I, and I, I say this, I've said this for 10 years. If you want me to build you a pink unicorn with a dildo coming out of its forehead, just give me a drawing and make sure your check clears. I don't really care. All right. We're <laughs> sending you over a drawing so, within a week. Yeah. Here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um, the machining stuff, we we do a fair amount of... We do parts for other off-road companies just through networking and stuff. And then we still do a fair amount of aerospace and and just it regular industrial stuff as well. So a little bit of everything, but I'm really trying to focus a lot of my effort in developing my own products. How much of your business percentage-wise is the off-road market versus other stuff? Currently, that's yeah. where I bleed all of my money. <laughs> so it's a negative part of your business. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I can tell you, like, I've got... I've got well into the seven figures in development cost on stuff and Uh we're shipping Jeep portals now, but like, and it doesn't matter how much you charge for race stuff. You're never going to make money on that because (laughs) if you look at market cap on something like that, okay, let's say Uh I probably have sold 30, 40 vehicles worth of portals for racing or Uh for like hardcore guys, even at call it 20, call it 30,000 for a vehicle for race stuff the market cap on that is like not sustainable for a business our size. Yeah. Like I would never make any money, yep. but I do it because I love it. And then I started to realize like, and this is kind of comes down more to business philosophy. Everything we make is done first in race, tested on race cars, and then we move it to mass market gotcha. if we can. Yeah. Is that just because the, the race environments makes it that much more sturdy or durable of a product or is that just well strictly it or what's the the theory behind that it's that but it's i will make a statement whether it's true or not it's my opinion that a weekend of racing is better than a year of testing because racers have and they're in that mindset in the moment that they have zero regard for their vehicle it doesn't matter if it's a twenty thousand dollar vehicle or a $600,000 $600,000 vehicle. They're there to push the limits of the vehicle. Yeah. And like when I started testing our Jeep portals a year and a half ago, I don't want to say I gave up, but I quickly realized that there was no way I was going to properly test these because I can't drive hard enough. I will literally rip brackets off the frame. I will break everything else on this brand new 392 that I just bought in order for what? Like to be able to test this. And then we're not really even testing it. So if I develop it in, in race, I know it's going to be fine for daily driving and for moderate recreational wheeling. 
I would agree. I mean, if anybody has watched what those vehicles go through out at like a race like KOH or um, oh, yeah. any of the Ultra 4 races, the Baja 1000 is another grueling one. I mean, the there's so many hardcore races out there that it's just those vehicles literally get pushed beyond their limits a lot of times. Um, and it's, yeah. it's pretty crazy what they do go through. So I like that philosophy of if you're, if it can survive a weekend of racing, you're good. You're good. You're fine. Yeah. <laughs> you, you got a good product <laughs> yeah. yeah, on everything that we're pushing and everything that we develop. It, it gets race tested. Gotcha. So let's talk about a little bit about portal technology Yeah, because explain what portals are for everybody out there who doesn't know from somebody who does this professionally designs them and engineers them. What's a portal here? So the simplest way to think of it is it's a gearbox at the wheel of a vehicle that provides lift and in most cases, a gear reduction. So it's basically a way to lift the vehicle and accommodate a big tire without lifting the suspension. And my opinion on this is if you actually ask people what they want, they don't really want to lift. They just want a bigger tire. Mm -hmm. And the conventional wisdom is the only way to do that is to lift the vehicle. Well, that's right, but there's different ways to do that. Body lift, suspension lift, or portal lift. It's just another lift. You don't do a a scissor jacks in the, under the rear, (laughs) between the rear axle and frame? (laughs) <laughs> no. I mean, it would lift it. It's just not yeah. gonna. Yeah. Well, hey, that's what I did back in the day. It was sawzalls. I mean, I in I think 2003, I put 40s on my my YJ because I could buy them from. So Walker Evans would sell me 40 inch tires for 75 bucks. Wow. <laughs> what? Yeah. I was yeah. about to ask if 40s were even around in 2003, but 40s were around. So. Are they old race uh, tires? Year, yeah. So okay. Goodyear yeah. made 40s. I don't think they made them specifically for Walker, but I ran into Walker and his wife, Phyllis, on Jackhammer one day, and there was nobody else there. And it was myself and one other friend. We come up on this vehicle, and I immediately knew who it was. Mm-hmm. And I ended up wheeling and becoming friends with him and buying tires off of him for really cheap. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah. That is another option on how to fit bigger tires is just sawzall yeah. your body away. Yep. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but you came yeah. up, you've uh, come up with a great solution, something that's been in the market for a really long time with uh, mainly on the Unimog side, but now you're yeah. bringing it t- kind of to the, um, another option out there for people to get, which is fantastic. Cause not a lot of us want huh. to solid axle swap with Unimog axles underneath our vehicles. No. And, and I started with Unimog stuff too. And the reason I got into all the portal stuff was one of my buddies who I'd wheel with at Johnson Valley had a set of Unimog portals on, on a buggy he built and he would break parts on them. And at the time I was getting into machining and I was naive enough to go, yeah, I can make that. And so I just yeah, kind of no dove into it that way. Yeah, no problem. Um, <laughs> Overconfidence is always the best spur of a new business. It's not even over. (laughs) It wasn't overconfidence. It was ignorance, really. Not realizing that the amount of... And I guess, you know, at the time, I didn't have a family. I wasn't married. Like, I could afford to spend the time just on hobby stuff. And that's how I learned. Having the time to figure it out. You don't know what you don't know. And I always laugh about that (laughs) with people. It's like... Well, I didn't know you could do that. I'm like, yeah, you don't know what you don't know. And now you know. So, well, But you also got to have the mindset that you can dive into something and figure it out. That is very true. There's a lot of people that yeah. don't have that out there. Yeah. That's how, I mean, that's, I think the best way to learn. Mm-hmm. You dove in from uh, getting to make parts for your buddy's Unimog portals. And yeah. then it just kind of went from there. Like when... When did you come up with this idea of creating a portal box that can bolt on to people's OEM suspensions? I had my eye on that in probably who 2015, I would say, 2016, but I knew that we were a ways out and you know, I didn't want to dive into that market at the time. I wanted to stay in the race stuff and I was actually I talked to Mason Motorsports. They contacted me when they were looking to build their first all-wheel drive. 
And I told Neil Mason flat out, like, my stuff's not ready. And I don't think that I have the solution for you. And so at that point, I kind of, I felt that the writing was on the wall, that four wheel drive was going to have to move that direction, especially if you were ever going to make an independent suspension really work properly. Yeah. And so I started thinking about that. I went down the road in 20, I'd have to 2017, 2018. I have to look at the NDA um, of basically working with X track. And I was going to do a four gear portal based on the X track gears, which was originally what Mason did. I think they make their own now, but I went down that road and realized it was, it was not going to be cost effective for what I wanted to do. And I kind of had one of those moments where I'm fighting some stuff and I realized like, man, it would be so much easier if this just had a spider tracks unit bearing on it. Mm -hmm. And so I had one of those, Oh, I'm going to design a portal around a unit bearing. And we developed that filed for a bunch of patent stuff around it. And it was at that time when I realized that if you were ever to do a portal in an OE application, you have to be able to incorporate wheel speed sensors and all the ABS stuff around it. And the absolute easiest way to do that is with a unit bearing. Yeah, it's all pretty much set up. It's got the port there, the tone rings built into it. Yeah. Yep. And and with you know the way. I guess the way all the, the OE market has gone is, I mean, they've been using unit bearings for a long time. It's a proven technology. It's cost effective. I just immediately went that direction, went a very different route than the x stuff. And I think, say, four years ago, it might have been five, five years ago, we developed the first four gear that all of our current stuff is based off of. And that gear set is still the same gear set that we run in all the four gear stuff today. Is there, I guess, other ways to build the internal gears on portal boxes? Yeah, I mean, there's, it's funny. I was, I'm making a video about this this week. So there's a bunch of different ways to do gears, but there's two that you'll see in a portal. You'll see helical cut gears or you'll see straight cut gears. Um, and there's, there's pros and cons to both. We specifically went straight cut for race because um, the big thing about straight cut is straight cut gears don't generate thrust. So that the most complicated, sense. well, so they just roll against each other. Yeah, they're Whereas not. Whereas a helical mm -hmm. one a, on a helical gear set, one is is axial loading one direction, one has axial load the other direction. So you get a lot more deflection. We're we're used to thinking about like a differential, right? So. You get a lot of deflection yeah. in the ring gear when that when you do helical stuff. Well, so that's a hypoid gear set. That's called a sliding gear set, whereas um, a straight cut is a rolling gear set. And on a sliding gear set, one is literally trying to jack the other gear away from it. Okay. And so okay. that's where you get all the deflection in, in ring gears. Okay. But you have to have that type of gear set because you're trying to change the direction yeah. Right. So yeah. you have it coming in one direction and you're trying to move 90 degrees off center. Yep. You could do yeah. that with a worm gear, but there's so much internal resistance in a worm gear. You take your foot off the gas and the rear end would lock up. I don't think Jeez. that would work out too well. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you guys use straight cut gears, um, four gears in there. Is there a way to do them with three gears or more gears or? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You could do three gear and they did that in, in UTVs. Um, yeah. and I, I'm always cautious about ever making a blanket statement. So I'm not going to sit here and say, Oh, three gear is bad and four gear is good. That's mm -hmm. total oversimplification. Mm -hmm. What I will tell you is in a four gear setup, you're doubling the amount of contact you have between your input and your output gear. So there's a whole formula that, that to how to calculate gears and strength and all this kind of stuff. And we won't go there. But I will tell you that it's not twice as strong, but it is significantly stronger because essentially you're doubling the surface area of contact and you're having to transfer power between an input gear, two idler gears and an output gear. Well, it's a lot stronger to run a four gear. The only reason you would ever run a three gear 
is if it's a packaging concern. Packaging to keep them smaller for UTVs. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, and more than anything, it's packaging of brakes. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. So, and we stuck with straight cut. And here's something I'll say about straight cut gears versus helical gears. So it's starting to be commonly understood where people equate straight cut gears to noisy and helical gears to quiet. That was going to be my next question. Okay. (laughs) It's totally the wrong question to ask because there is absolutely no reason for a straight cut gear to be noisy and a helical cut gear to be quiet. It has nothing to do with the helix. It has everything to do with something called contact ratio. So okay. if you're, and I'm, I'm not going to give all of the details on this, but I'll tell you that if you're a straight cut gear within a certain RPM with a certain contact ratio, it's quiet. Now, the only reason that a helical gear is quiet is because it has more tooth area in contact. But the flip side of that and the hardest part of a portal is on a helical, it generates thrust. And so the hardest part of designing a portal is not the gears, it's the bearings. That makes sense to be able to control the the thrust load of it all. Yeah. And so on our stuff, we don't have any thrust load. And that's why we do a a straight cut because that gear can float essentially. Mm -hmm. And we have a little bit of float on our gears. So now you don't have to preload bearings. But the big thing is... When we started doing all the calculations on will this live in a race application, we went for a helical gear at first and we sat down and we did the actual math and engineering behind it and we couldn't get a bearing to handle the loads. (laughs) Okay. And we flat out said, because so in order to handle thrust loads on a helical gear set, your bearings have to be rated for both axial and radial load. Okay. Yep. And the easiest bearing to do on that application is a ball bearing. Mm-hmm. You can do ball. You could do what typically is used in rear ends. You could do like a, a, a 10 degree tapered roller bearing, mm-hmm. but we didn't want tapered rollers because you have to preload those. And that's a pain. Mm. And then ball bearings are not strong enough. And so we basically said, we don't care if the gears make noise. We need a strong gear set and a strong bearing package. And when we first moved from race to to our Jeep stuff, we were super nervous. Like, is it going to be noisy? Is it not? And I got some super good info and a lot of kind of mentoring and coaching from Jason at TubeWorks. Oh, cool. Yeah. And he taught me how to... So there's two ways to design a gear you can do an equation-driven gear generation within a CAD program like SolidWorks, or you can do a much more sophisticated one. There's actual gear software where you can cheat. Like if the gear profile is, let's oversimplify it and call it Mm -hmm. a triangle, Mm -hmm. you can make that triangle wider at the base, narrower at the base. You can tweak the profile of the gear. And then that gear software will generate okay, this is rated for this kind of torque numbers. And so you can play with pressure angle. You can play with all different types of profiles of the gear and then go, ooh, that one looks good. And a lot of it literally, we've been people have been making gears for hundreds of years, right? Mm-hmm. Once you get the hang of it, you can kind of look at a gear set and go, yeah, that's going to be strong. What you don't see is, yeah, that's going to be noisy or not. Yeah. And again, noise has nothing to do That's an oversimplification too. Noise is a function of contact ratio. It's not a function of, is it straight cut or is it helical? And helical just inherently has a better contact ratio. Right. Does that software help you out with uh, the contact ratio so you can figure out the sound? Okay. No, it spits out a number and says your contact ratio is blah. And I go, ooh, okay, I need it to be. I need to tweak it one way or another. Yeah. Yeah. So like anything over the number that we want, I know it's going to be quiet. And here's the other thing that, because man, I hear this all the time and I just like, I I don't want to say I pull my hair out. I just wish that I could inform more people that while your engine might be spinning 
let's say, let's over exaggerate, say 8,000 RPM, your tire's not spinning 8,000 RPM. Your tire might be spinning 800 RPM. Yeah. And at 800 RPM, are you hearing gear whine? No, you're just not. If your contact ratio is good. Gotcha. Gear noise, when we moved to a mass market product or what we wanted to be mass market was a huge concern for me. And we got in and we went, oh, cool. It's not an issue. That's cool. Yeah, that's, that's great to hear. <laughs> yeah. So there's, there's a lot of stuff behind what makes gears work and what doesn't. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of science behind it or math, I guess. And it's all stuff that's been figured out. And so if you really take the time to dive into it, the literature is already out there. Yeah, It's just, you have to be able to absorb it. That's kind of like, I don't want to equate it to it maybe, but um, we, I got to sit down with the guys over at Yokohama Tires and talk about uh, tire technology. And they said that the hum of mud terrains on roads, you can change how loud or quiet that is by changing the size of the lugs and it and the ratio. The void of, ratio is what they call Not really it. the void mm-hmm. ratio, but it was... They said you if you make your tire with like four different lug sizes and then set that pattern up appropriately, you can really tune down or tune up the road noise coming out of it. So it's kind of that yeah, similar I thing. That. So well, it's a harmonics thing too, yeah. which again it, it comes down to math. Like in machining, I don't know when this happened. It was before my time, but everything used to be two flute or four flute end mills. And then they went to an odd number of flutes, so three flute and five flute. And and then they got into what's called a variable pitch. So the flutes are not staggered on a four flute. They weren't staggered 90 degrees apart. They kick them like a degree. And that changed harmonics. Interesting. So going from the race application of portals, you were designing and building these portals for races, and then you came out with them for the Jeeps. Did you keep the yep. same style from race to Jeep? Because you did talk about you stayed with the four piston, but how did yeah. everything go externally? So this is the idler gear on that we run in trophy trucks. So thousand horsepower, big block engines, 40 inch tires. Okay. That's that. Yep. That is the gear that goes on our Jeep or Tacoma or Bronco portal. Got it. So it looks so 80% the size. 10%. 10%. So it's 10% okay. smaller in diameter. Yeah. And it's the same tooth profile. Got it. Uh, okay. Not much smaller. Well, so not much smaller. So what we actually did, our first iteration, two years ago in Moab, we took out and basically I grenaded everything day one. And I missed... <laughs> I yeah, I missed a calculation on we were doing and, and again this equates back to bearings. So I had a needle bearing that ran inside of the idler and I hollowed out too much of it and the gear itself would split in half. Jeez. Wow. And it failed when I felt I was at twenty percent of what I should be. Wow. Like I was not wheeling it that hard. Okay. And We broke stuff and we came back and I said, okay, um, we can't afford to do this five times. I need to nail it the next time. And it was pretty clear that, okay, well, what do we know? Um, Calculating how much torque a vehicle puts down to the wheel is extremely hard. It's easy in the sense that you can just do it via math, right? But if you just look at math, my 392 Wrangler puts out significantly almost twice as much torque on paper as, say, Luke McMillan's trophy truck that puts out a thousand foot pounds of torque in a big block engine. Now, you're never going to convince me that in a world situation, that's the case, right? So where is all that going? It's, it's computer management, engine management software. And what we ended up saying is, We know the race stuff works. We know it holds up. Let's put the brake package back in and let's scale down the race stuff, the bare minimum to make it fit in the package that we need. And that's where we ended up with our current gear design is I knew that the bearings were good and I knew that the gear profile was strong, scale it 10% and it fit. Wow. That's all you needed. Yeah. That's cool. That's it. Mm Mm-hmm. 
talking about brake package are, is that kind of how you gauged it? You, you've kind of, you had, you knew you wanted a unit bearing, you knew you needed some certain size rotors and kind of a caliper setup. You just fit everything in, in between there. Yeah. I mean, basically when, whenever we start on designing a portal, um, and we don't do this anymore because we just have a formula and we know what works. We start with bearings and then we move to, okay, this bearing package will work. Then we move to, um, sketching out gears, sketching out the box, and then making sure the brake package that we want fits. And then we do the detail work. Like on the Jeep stuff, we figured out like, and this is industry standard. Now everybody's on a 17 inch wheel, which is good. Cause if we were talking 15s, Ooh, like there's just not room for stuff. Yeah. There's no room there. Right. But on a 17, we've got a gear set that we know works. And so for us to transition from one application like Jeep and then move it over to Toyota and to Bronco, it's not that difficult. And I think the Jeep market's interesting. It's the biggest motor and the biggest size tire that we're going to ever really run up against currently. So we solved that one. Jeep runs great. So for us to move that same gear set to Tacoma, it was literally, okay, make the brakes fit. Okay, what unit bearing are we going to design it around? Okay, go. And so the testing portion is super easy. Yeah, because all your all your internals are all the same between, say, the Jeep, the Toyota, and the Bronco portals. Yep. Um, so it's yeah. just a matter of then packaging it from there. You've already done the hard part. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so, I mean, Jeep took us a good solid year to develop. Bronco took us... Two months, a month and a half. Wow. <laughs> and that's, yeah. and that's version in a way that's a uh, version three. I'll just say, cause you went from yeah. Jeep to Toyota to Bronco. So you, yeah. you already uh-huh. had the, the plan and Toyota all the idea. It's the yeah. same amount of time. The only reason I didn't release Bronco and I think we're, we're installing Bronco today and nice. we'll be driving around on Bronco tomorrow. Um, Need we me to Jeep. drive down there with a Bronco real quick? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be down there tonight. <laughs> we got we got plenty of we got we got plenty of people that volunteer for tests. So yeah, <laughs> all of our testing we basically do in house. We test everything here first, and then I work with racers who I have like long relationships with. So like Lauren Healy is one of our guinea pigs on on everything. And so he'll get one of the very first sets of Bronco portals just because you know, the guy drives the wheels off of everything. And if like, he's a great it, test bed, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's such a double edged sword. <laughs> he knows how to break things. We get this debate and I see it online and I never chime in on it, but I'll tell you that there's a long conversation of who's harder on parts, trophy truck guys or ultra four guys, because trophy trucks run bigger motors they're not harder on parts. I was going to say, I like, mean, I, I can't imagine they're, they're not even doing anything close to trying to go up, you know, sledgehammer in at 30 miles an hour, 20 miles an hour. I mean, there, there's you, how can you calculate the forces on a vehicle of doing that? It's so difficult because if you start to try to dive into that, like, okay. And this is where like, do you know what FEA is? It's finite yeah. element analysis. It's, okay. There's, there's software programs out there that are very good at calculating what is the load on this part, given these constraints. Okay. And I think FEA is one of the best and worst things to ever happen to engineering. <laughs> okay. Explain, explain that. <laughs> so it so drastically oversimplifies. And if you don't get everything correct that you input into the model, then you will be so far off either in either direction, overconfident or underconfident. And most of the time, and especially like, how do you calculate how much force the vehicle sees when you stuff a tire into a rock doing 20 miles an hour up sledgehammer, right? You've got the deflection of the chassis of the tire of the wheel, like of, of, of everything moving, suspension absorbed stuff. Like we just got to the point where maybe if I had a team of 50 engineers, we could do it. Probably not. And we're probably not smart enough. 
<laughs> and so we just kind of said, okay, well, and this is where it comes down to. We test it on race. If the racers can't break it, then screw it. It's probably good enough. <laughs> and it's, <laughs> it's kind of, it sounds like it's, it's dummy math, but it kind of is the best. I mean, you can do all the math you want. Show me the real world testing. Yeah. Has anybody ever put G force or load sensors on an ultra four card during King of the Hammers or anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. They do. Yeah. Now, Ugh, I don't want to get this wrong. I want to say that at the wheel of the vehicle that you can see G forces up to like 60 G's. Like you just kill a person instantly. What? At oh the, my God. At the chassis. So I was, I was in the desert with a friend of mine. I'll abstain from names on all this stuff who sold an ultra four car and the guy that bought it, took it out and they had an accident and he broke his back. Okay. And that car had Motec on it and they had sensors on it and they measured that that hit that he took was a six G hit. And wow. it wasn't, it was after a bunch of rains and they basically dove into a wash mm. and hit the bulkhead. The car was fine. The dude, like it wasn't a bad, I, mean, I don't think there's ever a good broken back. <laughs> I was gonna but, say. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, a lot of the guys that run Motec are data logging that kind of stuff. Wow. And and I'll tell you from experience, like two years ago, I raced San Felipe, um, the Ultra 4 race with Bailey Cole. Yep. I was co-driving yep. with him. Oh, cool. And we were in second place chasing down Lauren Healy. So we're going down whole line road. We're doing a hundred miles an hour over whoops Jeez. and we come into a rock section and, and at a hundred, like I've raced class one, I'm super comfortable with that. And we got into the rock section and the pace that they go through rocks, like, nah, man, I'm good. If that's <laughs> what it takes to, to win at ultra four, that's more punishment than I'm comfortable putting my body through. So I don't know what the G forces are on that, but I'll tell you that it's so violent. I thought I was going to spit my soul out the windshield. It was bad. <laughs> yeah. We always joke that ultra four racers have, there's just something missing in their brains at uh, like, and we, and it's totally true. Every time we talk to one or talk to somebody who's been in a race car going over the rocks, I'm just like, yeah, no, thanks. Not for me. Yeah. <laughs> Like I raced KOH in 2008 with uh, Jack from CTM Racing. Okay. You know, C like CTM U joints. Mm -hmm. So Jack's been a friend of mine for a really long time. We raced it together. The pace back then and the pace now is so different. I would love to see what these like, and I don't mean to be a pessimist, but like, how's how are these guys going to feel when they're 70 <laughs> and walking around? <laughs> yeah, and they've been racing Ultra Four for you know, 20 years. Yeah. Um, it's not just a young man sport. I feel which most of the, most of the winning drivers are around my age or, or even older. Shears five years older than me, I think, mm. but man, you have to have a, a tolerance for a level of violence. That's it's impressive. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. It's definitely been quoted as a continuous car wreck for about eight hours or so, you know? Oh, and, and that's absolutely not an exaggeration. Right. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Heading back to the portal land. Um, I yeah. got a question, <laughs> um, in regards to since the internals are the same from, uh, I guess, uh, for, to Jeep, to Toyota, to, uh, the Bronco are all the lifts the same because it's all equal there. So, and what is that amount of lift that somebody's getting? Yeah, boy, that's a, the short answer is no. So here's the way to think of this. On a solid axle, we have no choice. You have a shaft going in, you have a gear set, and you have a shaft going out, right? And yep. you have to be, your input gear has to be at the center of that axle too. There's no, there's no easy way to get around that. And yep. I'm just going to, I'm just going to call that fixed points. Okay. So that distance is 3.88 inches. And we settled on that because we wanted, this might sound weird, the least amount of lift we could get. <laughs> okay. okay. Why, um, why is why is small? Because putting a five inch lift on a Jeep, like it's just too much. So like on my 392, it's bone stock and I could probably fit a 42 if it wouldn't rub the back, the, the front and rear section of the rear fender wells. I run a 40 because it just fits better on a Jeep. 
but mm-hmm. like like there's no reason to go bigger tire than a 40 especially with a portal like dude i can yeah you can drive over anything <laughs> yeah. with it yeah and on a jeep there's 10 different ways to lift it to put 40s on an independent it's a whole different ball game and and this is where i i go into the caveat is on an independent suspension a portal is not necessarily a lift for the vehicle what a portal allows you to do is to lift for the cv okay so you could put your lower a arm right back down into the same spot that it was before the portal and get no lift out of it or you could move it up three and a half inches or you could move it up 3.88 inches or anything in between so a portal on an independent is inherently going to be a CV lift. It doesn't necessarily have to be a suspension lift. Now, in our case, I oversimplify this on our literature and our website because the truth is on the Tacoma, it's a three and a half inch lift for the lower A-arm, meaning it lifts your suspension three and a half inches. Mm -hmm. And it's a round up, call it a point, well, it's a 0.38 inch additional CV lift. Okay. So my CV on my Tacoma actually sits flatter than it did from the factory. Yeah. So I have less angle than the factory does. And that was what we settled on because we thought from a geometry standpoint, like this gives us the best of all worlds. So that's the long winded answer. It was really impressive. Uh, we were good buddies with Dimitri over at Stellar Built. And so yeah. when he got the to put the portals on the Tacoma there, um, I actually went down to the shop and got to look at everything as he was going through the install that day. Yeah, it's impressive. You kind of look at everything after it's on. You're like, holy shit, that axle shaft is like perfectly level with the ground. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It sits dead flat. And yeah. so that's the biggest, what I'm learning on the fly. And it's kind of hard because like there is no market research. Like the Jeep stuff is well received. The independent stuff is like feverishly received Mm -hmm. because, you know, people go to long travel kits because it's the only way they can fit a bigger tire Mm -hmm. and stop me when I go too far down this rabbit hole. But the problem with independent and the problem with a long travel kit is they're all up travel and they're, they're no down travel. Yep. And this gets into suspension geometry. And when you start talking to shock guys who are like real shock guys, they'll tell you that the placement of that piston in that shock body is the most important thing. So if you've got, let's say, like, what does a long travel Tacoma get? 12 inches? Yeah, maybe. Give or take a couple yeah okay not a couple inches and so (laughs) my my tacoma gets nine inches right i'll contend that at high speed my nine inch travel will smoke a 12 inch travel for one reason what happens is you've got let's say you've got 12 inches and you've got nine up and three down And so you did that because you needed to lift the suspension to fit the big tire, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that three inches of droop that you're getting, you're always tugging on the limit straps, forcing the front end as you're going over bumps to want to pull down into those holes. And then that makes the ass end of of the vehicle pogo. And people think, oh, it just rides bad. I need more spring. So they'll throw spring at it, hoping to mitigate that. And it makes the problem worse. Or you need more more reservoirs is what a lot of people think. (laughs) (laughs) Or, or I'll see people, I'll see people put like bypasses on. And most of those bypass shocks are designed for the piston to sit mid travel. And so like I put three inch internal bypasses on my 392 and it rode horrible, like just it wrote, it wrote just absolutely like crap. And I'm good friends with the guys at Fox. And so I call my Kim there, who's the tuner. And I'm like, you got to help me, dude. And so he pulls up a spreadsheet and he shows me where my internal bypass shock piston is sitting. And he goes, well, no wonder it rides like shit. Like you're riding in the bump zone of the shock. Oh, geez. <laughs> and so, yeah, that'd be a problem. So Mike says, Mike says, hey, we need to design you new internal bodies. I said, cool, you design them, I'll make them. So he hands me a new drawing. We machine new internal bypasses 
for my setup. And that moved the bypass tubes where they, where he wanted them. And the vehicle rides amazing now. So, you know, there's a huge oversimplification of suspension saying that more travel is more. No, it's not more. Proper travel is better. And so I'll always contend that putting a shock in a happy spot and giving it not necessarily equal, but, but good piston movement up and down will always ride better than the long travel kits would sit on their, on their limit straps. Basically. That actually makes a lot of sense. Cause, um, you design everything so that you can keep pretty much the stock suspension set up on say yeah. a Bronco or a Tacoma, whatever you're doing. Mm-hmm. Is that essentially why? Because the stock suspensions are set up with their shocks and valving and everything and the bypasses, whatever they've got on them from the factory, they're set up in the right place already. So why mess with that? Yeah. I mean, there is still room for improvement based on OE suspension, right? But keep in mind that these companies like Ford, like Toyota, they have spent tens of millions, I'm guessing, on developing that suspension to ride good. And you're going to take theirs off and nothing against the lift kit guys out there. Some of them make really good products, but you're going to throw away all that geometry and all that engineering time just to fit a big tire. So if we can maintain all of that, like I get the question all the time, well, how does the Tacoma ride now? And I go, well, I didn't change anything. It rides just like a stock Tacoma. So Mm -hmm. it just... You know, I hear a little bit of, of noise out of the tires because I'm running a 37-inch BFG, but for all intents and purposes, it rides like a stock Tacoma does. Now, there's little caveats in that, but I mean, the thing drives great. I'm of the mindset that in the last decade, the OEs have all stepped up their games considerably. And the vehicles that they're putting out ride a whole lot better both on and off-road than they did in the 90s. Yeah, I think we would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. So your Tacoma is stock suspension, but it's not stock height and it's not stock width anymore. Uh, we did talk about the height just a little bit, but so how much wider is a portal than a stock, so, a stock suspension or stock wheel mounting yeah, surface? So the wheel mounting surface is moved out three and a half inches per side. Per side. Okay. Per side. And so I was constantly told one, you can't fit 37s on a Tacoma. And then two, if you go wider than two inches, you have to run fiberglass. Okay. And where are those true? (laughs) Those are not incorrect statements, but where people miss the boat is where the whole off-road industry misses the boat is in wheel selection. And so if you look at, if you look at every single wheel that comes off of every factory for every vehicle in the entire world, there's not a single OE that runs a zero offset wheel. Everybody runs deep, positive, let's call it, met, we'll stick with metric terms, like a plus 40 or a plus 50 or a plus 30. Wheel selection matters way more. So like Jeep guys, for some reason, focus on, oh, how wide are your axles? Well, that's the wrong question. The question you should be asking is, what is the distance from outside of tire to outside of tire? Because if I run a plus 40, 30, well, we'll make it easy for math. If I run a plus 25 wheel versus a zero wheel, you just narrowed or widened your vehicle by two inches overall. That's a lot. And my Tacoma, I run a plus 35 method on that because that was the deepest offset that I could find that sucks everything back in. And there's two main reasons you really need to run a high positive offset wheel. One is scrub radius, and on a portal, inherently, I hurt scrub radius. There's no getting around that. At the end of the day, I have to fit two bearings and a gear. I have to widen the package. I yes, I can't use Bluetooth yep. portals. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other thing there is wheel selection. Like you hear about guys wearing out bearing packs all the time, right? And oh, my unit bearing wore out. Well. If you're putting a negative offset wheel on a unit bearing, then you're not properly loading that bearing pack. And of course, it's going to wear out because that's not what it was designed to do. Mm -hmm. It's like taking a... When you think of engineering terms, over-engineer things, put a foot-long wheel spacer on there 
and think of what kind of torque now you're putting on that unit bearing Mm -hmm. versus put the wheel on that the OEM designed that bearing pack to handle and you're good. And so with a plus 35 wheel, you guys saw the Tacoma, it doesn't really sit that wide. Like I could flex that out and I don't need fiberglass. It doesn't rub the the top of the fenders. Had to trim a little bit on the the front and the back side, Mm -hmm. but it's not it's not an issue with the right wheel selection i had to do that with my 33s <laughs> yeah <laughs> well on a stock suspension so, yeah i mean i've tried really hard to make sure that nobody has to do any fabrication with our kits so on the tacoma stuff i was super happy and relieved to hear that like tacoma guys when they talk about oh you got to do a body mount relocation kit everybody is so used to, oh, that's not a big deal. Everybody does it anyway. So I'm like, okay, that's a hurdle I can get around. Yeah. And with a proper offset wheel too, when you widen things, you mess with that scrub radius, your turning angle, it swings wider when that happens too. So you, with like a negative offset wheel, you have to trim more than with a positive offset. Mm -hmm. And getting wheel manufacturers to make positive offset wheels like the head engineer over at method is a friend of mine and his comment to me when we were doing the tacoma build was don't worry man you and i are both pushing the same boulder up the hill (laughs) and i said to him it's fine i'll push it with you because the only reason that a negative offset wheel exists in the off-road industry is so that people can widen their vehicle and fit bigger tires and do it cheap there's nothing good about it it's a weaker wheel um, and it messes up your suspension geometry. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, we had talked on the phone a, a while ago, a little bit back, and we were talking about what it would look like to get portals on uh, my new axes I'm building, which are 72 and three quarter, almost 73 WMS. Um, and you were like, well, yeah, just get a positive offset wheel. It's <laughs> like, yeah. I was like, oh, I never thought about that. That's actually, yeah. It's I'm surprised that more people haven't thought about that. And that's a, yeah. So going positive offset helps suck everything back in, gets you a little bit better, uh, steering geometry, not geometry, steering handling better. It's that is one of the reasons people break steering is that as you put a negative offset wheel on, it's an exponential amount of force placed on your steering based on your wheel. And there's, Torque equals R radius times force, right? Yeah. R cross F. And Mm -hmm. so you are putting a lot more torque on your steering when you move out on that radius. You're creating a bigger and bigger leverage. That makes sense. uh Uh-huh. It's just a giant lever arm. Yeah. And so you look at guys that are super wide or super negative offset wheels and they break steering components. And a lot of them kind of don't understand why. And I'm like, well... (laughs) <laughs> There's some math that'll back that up and tell you why, Yeah, but it's just an uphill battle. Cool. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the gearing here. Cause there's a, yeah. you mentioned one little thing that I think is a huge, massive, massive, uh, purchasing point for people that might be looking into portals is that there's a lot of things you would typically have to do in order to gain the same thing out of a portal that you no longer have to do. Cause there's people that'll be like, Oh shit, 20, $25,000 for a full set of portals. I can't afford that. But when you look at everything they have to do in order to fit the bigger tires that they're doing already anyways, and not including, you know, the gearing aspect of it as well. Is it really that much of a difference in cost? Well, so we picked the gear set that we did for a specific reason. So if you, if you do something super simple and you go, okay, they have a 1.22 gear set. Why, why 1.22? Okay, well, on a Jeep, let's say it comes with a 32-inch tire and you want to go to a 40. That's a 22% larger tire. Mm. On a Tacoma, if you start with a 30-inch tire and you want to go to a BFG 37, which is really more like 36, yeah. that's a 22% larger tire. So all we're trying to do on everything on these, this whole portal line through all the vehicles is put the vehicle back to stock with a big tire. So I still run 391 gearing in my axles 
that's came from the factory. I don't have to re-gear because the drivetrain doesn't know the difference between a 30 and a 37 because we put that gear reduction out there. So our sales pitch, I guess, is the portal is everything and you're done. It's your lift. It's your re-gear. It widens you. You want a little bit, you know, beefier stance. For the Tacoma, it solves a bunch of other issues that we just had to do in the process. It's a disc brake conversion for the rear. And then in every application, we take, you have to have a traditional semi-float axle housing. So we take that, your whole rear axle shaft, we take that whole thing out, we throw it away, and the portal bolts onto that four bolt flange. Makes a full and float. Then now, and it makes you a full float. Wow. Bitchin'. And what do we do? Well, we already put 35 spline shafts in that. So your final drive on everything we make is inch and a half 35 spline because you're you're gonna broach a hole in it. Why not just go 35 spline? Yeah. And so it's like all of these upgrades packaged into one. And what I what I say to people is at the end of the day, you might be close, but you're not close in the sense that like and this is a harder battle to win for me on Jeep stuff, which is guys are like, oh, I could put one tons in on that thing for the price of portals. And I go, that's cool, but you're missing the fact that like I'm not selling strong axles. We are, but that's not really my goal. I'm mm-hmm. selling ride quality and ground clearance. Yeah. And nothing else in the world is going to give you ground clearance except the portal. Yeah, you can you can go to a ten and a half sterling, but you'll lose four inches of ground clearance. <laughs> well, and here's the other thing. You don't need any of that stuff. So now the race stuff is a different gear ratio. We make a 1.63 and a 1.45. And so that takes additional stress. So the 1.22 in the portal, everything inside of that gearbox spins 22% faster with 22% less torque. Mm -hmm. So what I always point to, because guys are like, oh, I'm hard on my stuff. Oh, I break axles and this and that. And I tell them, I go, look. Lauren Healy runs a 35 spline axle shaft in the rear of his 850 horse four wheel independent car that runs portals. He's never once broken an axle shaft. You don't break axle shafts anymore because the portal takes load off of those components. Mm -hmm. So your ring and pinion way stronger because you're a 391 instead of a 529. The pinion strength is is much bigger. And then more importantly, you see 20% less torque on all your drivetrain components. So everything lasts longer. When we talk about a conventional kit versus a portal, it's not really apples to apples. It's it's just different. It's It totally is different, but I would still argue that in order to achieve everything you're doing with a bolt-on portal application, I would argue you're going to spend more than $25,000, $30,000. Oh, on a Jeep, <laughs> you'll probably... So... Trevor from WFO is a friend of mine. Yeah, we, know we had this conversation uh, eight months ago, maybe. If if you bring Trevor a Jeep, a brand new JL, and you put a long arm kit, coilovers, and one tons under there, you're forty to fifty grand mm-hmm. out the door. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you that that is going to be an inferior wheeler to a stock Jeep on portals. I'll tell you that if you're running Rubicon and you try and follow me, I'll take you on lines that you just won't be able to do. But I'm also not going to bomb through the desert in my 392 because it doesn't have the up travel that a long arm Jeep on that would. But again, you go back to an independent suspension, I don't see any downside to them. (laughs) I mean, being that I'm a Jeep guy, or that's where I started, like I'll be the first to admit there are pros and cons to a Jeep portal. I can't see anybody make a valid argument that there is one. So Paul Horschel, okay. he likes zero scrub on his independent cars. And so Paul, Paul and I talk, I consider Paul a friend. He doesn't run portals because his primary concern on suspension is, I think, I don't want to speak for him is he doesn't like scrub. Um, I'm going to give you two inches of scrub. There's nothing I can do about it. Sorry. It's just going to happen. But everybody else that's on an independent suspension, they're all moving. All the racers are moving to portals just because all the benefits, like Mm -hmm. you just can't, you can't do it any other way. Yeah. 
How did you deal with or get over the fact that there's now sort of a leverage point that's lower on, especially on a, a solid axle? I'm not sure how yeah. that quite affects the independent because it has upper and lower mounting probably helps prevent any, I don't know what you, to call it, like an arc or a swing. Well, that it's, it so happens. it's a rotational torque force that okay. you're trying to mitigate, yeah. right? How do we get around that? Or how do you solve for that? We don't. You don't? What I will... Well, B- bigger hardware to get it on there? <laughs> uh, it's not really... It, it has not reared its ugly head in any scenario to date. Here's what I will tell you. This is super interesting. Um, sometimes you'll make a solution fit a problem, right? Okay. You'll say, so, and I'll give you an example. So there was a trophy truck guy that ran our two gear stuff and he would consistently rip upper control arms off his chassis or every time he raced it. I don't, that's not a fair statement. Every time he raced that thing, he'd be chasing cracks. The, the chassis was cracking okay. and we were pretty sure that that was from torque induced by the portal. He switched from our two gear stuff to our four gear stuff and he's never had a crack since. That's interesting. Is that because the gears are redirecting that torque into more of a, an equal lateral force rather than a, because with two gears, so, yeah, I don't know how to say that. <laughs> Well, with two gears, you're trying to rotate around the top gear. Exactly. With four gears, your upper and lower gear are trying to pull in the same direction. I mean, yeah. And so, mm-hmm. so this was an interesting thing when we started diving into bearings and packaging. And then, and this was after we destroyed everything in version one <laughs> out at Moab, right? We came back and we sat down and drew detailed force diagrams. And I was a little surprised to what we found. And we literally did it three times. And I made different engineers at my company do it separately and not help each other to verify that we were coming to the right conclusion because it didn't make sense to me. So what we found was the gears will see equal forces, but the bearings do not. And that's a function of one set of the gears is trying to push together and the other set is trying to pull apart. And what you have is you have you have a pressure angle on a gear. It's just a working pressure angle. Let's call that on our stuff it's 20 degrees. Mm-hmm. So you have force vectors on that 20 degree pressure angle on one side of the gears those forces are adding up and on the other side they're subtracting. Mm-hmm. And so one bearing on the portal, on the idler gears, we'll see considerably more force than the other side bearing. And my thought on this is, and this goes back to, you know, torque load and mitigation stuff is those idlers are spinning in the reverse direction and your uppers and lowers are all trying to pull the same. And so people will constantly say, oh, you're going to break ball joints. And I'm of that same mindset that yes, you are going to put additional load without a doubt on those ball joints. How much? I'm, I'll be honest. I'm not really trying to calculate it because if you're concerned about it, there's lots of companies that make good quality ball joints out there, mm-hmm. right? The Dynatrack Pro, St- Pro Steers are badass. Um, Synergy makes a good ball joint. There's a bunch of companies that make those. And then on the rear, on the Tacoma... Um, well, on the Jeep stuff, people often look at it and go, oh, it's going to rip the axle tube or something like that. I hear the argument and I'll tell you that uh, we have braces for it, but I purposely not installed them. And to see if you do rip I'm, one off. Yeah. yeah well, you got to find one somehow, right? right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's just not been a problem. Yeah. Um, cool. I'm sure somebody might do something now. Here's a topic for Tacoma stuff that's worth talking about is axle wrap. I was gonna, yeah. I was gonna lead into that. Good, okay, for sure. So I will say that, like, I took my Tacoma out wheeling in Big Bear. Um, it drove great, and I got up into a couple hill climbs where, ye, I uh, I bounced on it a little bit and I felt axle wrap and was like, ooh, okay, so. I'm going to work with Deaver and develop a spring under that's okay. basically a heavy duty pack that provides no lift. 
And okay. so if, you know, this comes down to, um, if you're concerned about axle wrap, we have a solution for that. It's probably going to be 1200 bucks and go spring under. Not a, um, not a the solution. Isn't just to link it. Sure. <laughs> well, <laughs> That's another option. So, That's a, yeah. I mean, yes, absolutely. And, and my goal with both my 392 and now with my Tacoma is to leave it as stock as possible. So I can point to it and say like, yeah, that's a stock Tacoma. For all intents and purposes, mm-hmm. I have a stock Tacoma on 37s. If that was my personal vehicle, fuck, that thing would already be cut apart and I, I would have it linked already. Yeah. Right? But my goal is to, to push this product as a one and done. Yeah. You bolt this on and you're finished for 95% of the people that are going to wheel it. It's going to be amazing. Mm-hmm. If you're one of those guys, and I am, that wants to push things harder... Yeah, link it for sure. Absolutely. But I'm not going to do that. It's got like yeah. my 392 is amazing. It's a great vehicle and it's got very limited up travel because the motor mounts are so huge. If that vehicle was not a quote unquote work vehicle that we take to shows and stuff, then I would have hacked those motor mounts off and made my own in a heartbeat. But that's not, that's not the it's customer not the purpose, that I want. Yeah. Yeah. It's not the purpose of it. Yeah. Yep. So I try to keep things stock ish. Stock ish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's cool. So you have the uh the Jeep stuff has been out for a while. The Tacoma yep. stuff just came out for the the third gens. Does it yes. does it retrofit to the second gens as well? Or this speaks to Toyota as a company. Mm-hmm. So we have 2005. So our our bolt on Tacoma portal fits 2005 to current Tacoma. Wow. It okay. fits 2000. Hold on. We, this is, this is going to be a long list. <laughs> oh, it's 2003 to current forerunner. It's the whole FJ line that was in the mix there. It's Hilux overseas. It's GX 460 and it's GX 470. And then in Europe, it's also the Prado and the I Prado, yep. one other. And wow. so it's like, it's so many platforms and I will tell you that the we're going to make a tweak, it looks like, and the same, essentially the same gear set and same bearing package and 90% of the same components are also going to work on Tundra, 200 series Land Cruiser, and without giving out too much information, uh, 2024 Tacoma is... is I'll have a 2024 Tacoma portal before you will have a 2024 Tacoma. Wow. I'm jealous. I know. right? <laughs> <laughs> and it's, and it's so similar. It's like, it's so cool. That's, Toyota has been awesome to work on from, from a platform standpoint. Yeah. And that's yeah. one of the, that's one of the things that kind of makes Toyota unique. I don't want to say unique, but I mean, they're, that's like Legos. Right. You could just kind of take yeah. parts and take them off one vehicle, put them on another vehicle. They use a lot uh-huh. of the same interchangeable parts, interchangeable platforms. And especially with their new chassis design that they're going after, it's going to be really yeah. interesting to see how interchangeable parts will be in the future for in that aftermarket um, well, market too. If you, if you looked at the TRD Pro, the rear suspension on that TRD Pro is links and coils, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's, uh, look at the Tundra. Mm-hmm. It's links and coils. Yep. Um, front suspension differs a little, but I was super excited about the Bronco, and I think Bronco is an awesome platform. I'm equally or more excited about the 24 Tacoma. I cannot wait to get my hands on one. Yeah. Because yeah. that thing's going to be awesome. It is. We just, uh, that was our last interview we did was with Toyota corporate about the 24 Tacoma and some of the, the big changes that came with it. So we're also excited to see it come out. Yeah. What other vehicles do you, are you planning a bunch of other vehicles? Or are you just kind of looking and seeing, making sure yes. everything gets caught up here in the market first? Yeah. So, um, we're going to do Tundra 200 series Land Cruiser 2024 Tacoma platform, which will also uh, cross right over into when they release the new generation of forerunner. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing that's kind of on our radar, a friend of mine who's a racer. Please who don't say Range Rover. 
No. Okay, good. <laughs> That's not an off-road vehicle. Come on, man. <laughs> oh, we have some listeners that are going to give me a call now. <laughs> so there's a couple guys who I'm friends with who've been screaming at me for two years now. You need to pay attention to the Chevy Colorado ZR2. Uh, uh-huh. And I'm like, yeah, okay, we'll see. And I had a very good conversation with Dave, who's the owner of AEV. Oh, interesting. Okay. And he and I are looking at the Chevy Colorado platform together. We're in initial conversations about it, but if there's ever somebody that I would want to work with, it's a size of company like AEV. So like I'm in the process, I'm supposed to fly out in like a week to Mopar and Mopar is onboarding us as a Mopar approved aftermarket supplier. Okay. So you'll be able to buy our Jeep portals at Jeep dealerships under a Mopar. Well, it's under our name, but with a Mopar stamp of approval. Okay. Nice. Cool. Congratulations. Yeah. It, it is. That's cool. But that's a huge step up. And I don't know. I think the best step is to work with a company like the size of AEV, where I don't know that it's my place to get into annual volumes of what they do. But AEV is that middle ground where they build really cool, tricked out vehicles. They cater to a higher end clientele. And I mean, let's be honest, like the AEV stuff, their shit's pretty dialed. They take their time and they release things when they're really ready. And that Chevy Colorado, it's it kind of fits in a different category where like you have Toyota guys who are feverishly Toyota guys. And then you have Jeep guys who will be Jeep guys till they die. And the guys that don't really fit into either one of those categories, I think the Colorado is a rad vehicle. So we get all kinds of funky requests. But what I tell people is I pay attention to the requests. And when it's you and two of your buddies, not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to make a portal for it. Yeah. But when I see a market segment that I think is worth going after, like I looked at, this is going to be an odd one. I talked to the company about the cyber truck oh. and then I've actually talked to Rivion directly and I think they're cool platforms. I don't know that that's a route that's right for us at this time. Cause mm-hmm. I mean, we're only, as a company, we're 25 people. Wow. We're not huge. And the engineers I have are, are rock stars. Like, we're, they're super good. But with limited resources, man, like, we can't do everything. Yeah. Yeah, we pick slowly at what, what we think is the best product. But that also talks about how you just, you released 10 of these portals for the Tacoma here just recently have all 10 of those yeah. uh, been picked spoken for yet i think we have two or three sets left so like jimmy's writing you a check right now so just <laughs> <laughs> maybe so, like i think we might have a couple i was out of town last week um i was in lake powell so i haven't really got caught up on all the the inquiries my goal on that and the reason we only did a short run is I want to get them in the hands of these guys this summer so that we can wheel. And we're set up for production. Like we do runs of, you know, parts for customers, 10,000 at a time, but there's a lot that goes into building a set of portals. And I didn't want to have them in three to four months. I wanted them in six to eight weeks and we're already a week and a half into that. So I want to do a short run so that we can just get them out there. Yeah. Get them out there, get people seeing them, get people playing with them. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And the more people see them, the more they like all you ha- I tell everybody, all you have to do is wheel with a rig once through rocks on portals. And you'll be either you'll either be pissed off, frustrated, and want to throw in the towel, or you'll be convinced immediately that this is what you have to buy. Yeah. Like we had a guy at King of the Hammers this year, and this was it was so it was so awesome the way it went down. We had a racer come by and like glare at us and kind of walk off and then turn around. And he yells at one of my guys. He said, you guys ruined the 4,600 class. <laughs> Nobody can even compete anymore. Yeah. And it was like, like he was legitimately angry. But the reality of that is like, 
that's just a like a product that anybody could just bolt on. Yeah, and you can get a set too. Put them on your rig. I, and, so that was our comment. We're like, hey man, we'll sell them to you too. <laughs> I mean, and and you know the the saying that like saying that they're expensive. It's a relative term. I mean, mm-hmm. there's a lot that goes into them, and you know, there's a couple things that were in the process of doing to cut prices. So I'm looking at and going to try to move everything to forgings. And I want to stick with aluminum. I don't like cast iron because it's just dirty and heavy. Mm -hmm. And so I want to stick with like all of our uprights are 7075 aluminum. And Toyota, when I met with them at Overland Expo West, the engineers were kind of razzing us a bit. And they're like, holy cow, you made this upright out of 6061. This thing's super beefy. And I said, no, 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 that upright's not 6061. It's 7075. And he goes, Jesus, like, why would you do that? that?" And I said, because I don't have the engineering power that you guys do. And I know for a fact that trophy trucks can't break this. And if a trophy truck can't break it, then the Toyota guy is not going to. And he goes, okay, I I get it. And, you know, if you have limited resources, over-engineer it. Yep. Um, but I don't want to go to iron because it's so heavy. Yeah. And so forgings is the next step. It's just finding the right supply house, having all the dies made. It'll take us a year. It's going to be a lot in tooling so, yeah, to set all up. It's a couple hundred grand in tooling. Yeah, Jesus Christ. Yeah, so you, better, <laughs> you better be pretty confident in that design because once you make the tooling, like you're married. Yeah. I mean, you can throw it away. It's just... I don't want to throw away a couple hundred grand. Yeah. If I don't have to. I'll, yeah. I'll buy all the tooling yeah. off you for two grand. How's that when you're done with it? <laughs> no, hopefully we're not done with it. Yeah. That's the, you know. <laughs> yeah. But but the forge stuff, Toyota will be the first forging that we do because I'm just blown away at how well received the product is in the Toyota market. Like Toyota guys. I've had guys literally drive from pretty far away to come down to give us money to put their name on a set because they wanted to see them in person. Yeah. I'm like, all right, sure. Like, you want to swing by? Come on down. Yeah. Um, and it's cool to show people like, hey, we make everything in house. Mm-hmm. Um, it's all done in San Diego at our facility and you know, give people a tour. And I think that's if I was in their shoes, that would be cool to me, too. If you're really an enthusiast. Yeah, we may have to stop by. Or um, I'm in the works of planning a trip down to the Baja 1000 again this year. So oh. we may um, stop on by and go down the Tijuana side instead yeah. of uh, San Felipe area. So in yeah. Calexico. So I mean, we're the street that I'm on. Like on any given, especially when you get close to races, there's always trophy trucks running up and down the street. <laughs> and we all kind of stop what we're doing and congregate out to like the front door. Because you'll hear like so Tisco, Fortin, Score, like Score's actual facility, wow. Accutune, McMillan, we're all in like the same block. Oh, cool! It's <laughs> so just a, a good little pocket of of race companies, and that's fun. There's always race trucks running up and down the street. It's cool. <laughs> nice. Well, cool, man. Anything else that you wanted to to tease people about, or let people know uh, any important dates coming up for launches on anything? Um, yeah, so we have Bronco done. We're actually bolting on a set of Bronco portals today, um, and we'll be driving around this week on them. Um, so we'll be releasing Bronco portals. I would think we're going to do, we'll probably do the same thing, a short run, because I think the, you know, we do 10 sets, they'll get gobbled up right away. So Bronco is real close to release. And oh, one more thing that we have, we haven't talked about but we're well in the works. You've seen our steering rack for Bronco, right? That's right, yeah. So we're prototyping and doing one of those right now for Tacoma. Oh, and, nice. That's good. And the same issues with the Bronco rack is the same reason why people break the Tacoma rack. Um, and we know we've got that one solved. Again, uh, Lauren Healy on 42s, can't break the Bronco rack. So I go, cool. It's good enough for everybody else. (laughs) We're taking that same style of oil impregnated bronze and one shot where the rack and pinion sits. We one shot that on a precision five axis. And 
So I'm thinking probably late this year, um, we will have a full steering rack replacement for uh, the Tacoma. And we'll test that on a couple race vehicles that are racing 4,600 in Toyota stuff. We somehow found ourselves in the steering niche, I guess. Um, well, yeah. Apparently you're solving a problem that nobody's been able to solve yet. It's kind of like the, you're creating your own industry with the portals. Now you're kind of, uh, you're like, well, yeah, we can, I know what the, well, how to, know what the, I have an idea on how to solve this. Let's see if it works. And if it works, then kudos. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, well I guess, so I'll touch base briefly on this for me to take the time to develop a product. It's got to fall into one of three categories. Either nobody makes it and it's a problem and we think we can solve it because we're kind of in a unique spot. Like we have like millions of dollars in super high end equipment that we've purchased for aerospace stuff. Right. And then I have a group of really talented programmers and super good engineers. And so either the product falls into one of three categories, either nobody makes it and I feel that there's a market for it or somebody makes it and it's junk. So we can do it better Mm -hmm. or somebody makes it and it's ridiculously overpriced for absolutely no reason. And there's a market for it. Yeah. And if it doesn't fall into one of those three categories, like you're not going to find me making bumpers and lift kits because honestly, there's lots of good companies out there that do that. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do what everybody else does. Yeah. You don't want to get into the 70, 75 bumper market. No, no. (laughs) No, I mean, we'll make little trinkets and stuff. Like we made hinges for the Jeep. I don't, because I wanted to, or I don't, I don't know how that came about. We'll make little trinkets and stuff. Uh, Yeah. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. But if we're going to tackle a, like a real product line, it's got to be something unique that I feel there's a hole in the market. And like our Bronco steering rack is, dude, we're, we're selling the heck out of those things for the simple fact that like there is really no good solution. And if we can come up with one, yeah, we got the stuff to do it. That's cool. So, yeah. I like it, man. That's cool. awesome stuff, dude. Thanks, man. I'm sure we're going to get some questions in from listeners about it. I know that, like you said, it's it's been a big topic in the the Toyota world, uh, yeah. the Tacoma world, for sure. So I'm sure we're going to get some listeners that have some questions. Um, if they do, can they reach out to you, reach out to 74 Weld? Should they send them yeah, to us? Or what, what would you prefer? I get a lot of people that inquire through the website, and then I try to make phone calls, and they're like, no way. Like we didn't think you'd actually call us. And so my comment to everybody is like, look, man, if you have questions, like I answer the phone, I mean, feel free. You can, you can email, um, you can reach us online. Um, you can literally send an email to like, I have a catch all email. So if, if you, Hey, I have a portal question at 74 weldcom like literally I'll get that email. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. (laughs) You can email info at 74 Weld. You can find all of our contact on our website. We have a lot of info and we try to answer as many questions online as we can. But, and you can always pick up the phone. Yeah. We're, we're typically around. Sweet, yeah. man. We'll put that uh, contact info down in the show notes for everybody. So if you guys want to reach out to Quinn cool. over at 74 Weld, you can definitely do that. Jimmy, any other questions for Quinn? No, I, I'm super excited. I'm mm-hmm. I'm super anxious to get some portals on my rig one day yeah. here, and hopefully in the near <laughs> future. I think it, yeah. I really do believe the same. What you've been saying, it's like this is the best solution to lift a Tacoma. Yeah, it, it really is, and and it'll translate to every independent suspension platform. It really is like the only good way to lift independent. I love the Jeep stuff. I think it's great. I'm not going to sit here and say that it's for everyone because there's 10 different ways to put a 40 on a Jeep. Of the 10 sets that we're doing on the short run, I know three guys on them have already committed to running 40s. Nice. (laughs) And so, because they already have lifts, they already have all this stuff and they're like, well, do I have to go back? And I'm like, no, man, just run a 40 on it. (laughs) Perfect. (laughs) And so we'll start to see some of that stuff, which I think will be really cool. YouTube. So also we're trying to put out more content on YouTube. Oh, perfect. And so search us on YouTube. Like this week, we're going to film a video where we're going to open up and talk about the race stuff, the Jeep stuff, 
Tacoma and Bronco and, and literally show you all the internals. That's cool. I'm a big proponent of showing what we do because Mm -hmm. I don't think it's rocket science. I think that we know all the nuances of how to make it work properly Mm -hmm. and it's not voodoo. It's just stuff that we've learned by doing it for over a decade and you learn the little nuances of what works and what doesn't. And I'm more than happy to share that because I think people appreciate a deep dive into things. So yeah, people want to know how things work for sure. Check us out on YouTube and yeah. Yeah. People also appreciate the honesty. Yeah. I, when I look at the companies that I follow throughout different industries, I, I go for those companies that I feel make an open, honest and quality product. And so that's what I want to emulate. Yeah. Awesome. That's going to be exciting, yeah. man. I guess that's it. That's if people all. want to get some questions over to us and we can funnel them over to Quinn or anything else, uh, you guys can always do that by calling us 916-345-4744. Uh, we've got emails, we've got Instagram, lots of different ways to get a hold of Jimmy and I here. So I guess we come down to one of my favorite parts of the show, uh, final words. So Jimmy, final words for everybody out there. I want a mill now. You want a mill? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Quinn, final words for everybody out there. Yeah, I just encourage everybody to dive into projects. Nothing's that difficult. And if you want to put your mind to something, just do it. Cool. I like it, man. And with that, my friends, keep crawling. I got one for you. Mm -hmm. Did you hear about the fire at the circus? Mm -hmm. No. It was intense. Like camping. Like camping. Yeah. But doing something else. There's no, you don't want your fire at camping intense. Oh, okay. You sure? I wouldn't want my fire. Horton has my his tent. Fire. Horton, Horton puts true. fires. In, Horton that, puts tires in his tent. <laughs> that is true. Horton did have a fire in his tent yes, last year, but it was in a stove. That's semantics. <laughs> <laughs>